I was in Haiti a week before the assassination, and I was there working on an investigation into arms trafficking, and specifically arms trafficking uh, implicating the head of presidential security, man, Dimitri Gerard, and that you know I had information that the FBI was actively investigating him and looking into his role in arms trafficking. And, and the week before the assassination, I had a, a high-level police source tell me that yes, they were aware of that investigation. They had handed over documents to the FBI and to U.S. investigators. And not only that, that President Moise was aware of that investigation, but wasn't personally going to make a move against Gerard because he was waiting for the United States to act. And a week later, he was dead. And now Dimitri Gerard is in jail, allegedly implicated in the assassination itself, right? And so I tell that story because I think it provides a little bit of context into what was going on at the time, right? You had a police force that had been politicized and fallen apart and had been collapsing. You had a president who was besieged, who many believed his term had already ended, right? So we have this idea now that the president was assassinated and then things sort of went off the rails and have gotten worse from there. No doubt they've gotten worse, but it wasn't the assassination that started that. The assassination happened because things were already off the rails, right? Because it was already going that direction. What was surrounding the president was a toxic situation of allies who wanted power over him, right? Of an opposition who wanted power over him, but all sorts of different uh, you know, factors surrounding him that made it, while shocking, not at all surprising, right? For me, we don't know still today the ultimate masterminds of the assassination or what the real motivations necessarily were behind it. But there is one fact about the assassination that I think is extremely important to understand. And that is that just about everybody implicated claims to have been operating with the support of the United States government. And that's not to say that the United States government was behind the assassination of these people who were telling the truth, but they were convinced of it. And I think that tells us something bigger about this dynamic, which is, again, how influential the United States can be. Even if it's not real, the mere perception of U.S. support for something can be enough to convince people to assassinate a president. It's exciting to get the book out. It's obviously been, um, you know, a lot of research and a lot of work that went into it, but it's, you know, it's, I don't see it as sort of the end, right? I mean, it's the point of it is for it to be a, a tool to be able to shine a light on these issues, to be able to talk about these issues and to bring more awareness in general around not just the history of Haiti and the more recent history, but also what's happening now and, and help to try and sort of untangle that web and, and offer some advice or lessons about what might be more useful moving forward in terms of US policy. So I, I first got involved with Haiti after the 2010 earthquake, you know, and I think like a lot of people, uh, you know, we, we wanted to do something. I was working at a, a research organization here in D.C., the Center for Economic and Policy Research. A number of my colleagues had, had history with the country, were connected with groups there, and so we wanted to do something. And we knew, and what I think my colleagues understood far better than I did at the time, was that the decisions made in Washington were going to have a huge impact on what was happening for the future of Haiti. And so being in Washington, we actually were in a unique position to be able to keep an eye on that and be involved in that part of the discussion. And what we realized really quickly was, you know, what we were hearing from, from organizations on the ground, from the people on the ground that we were talking with, and what they were looking for, what they needed, uh, what they were aware of in terms of these billions of dollars in pledges for, for Haiti's relief and reconstruction, didn't match at all what we were hearing uh, in terms of the conversations we were part of in Washington, D.C., right? And so, we launched, uh, you know, what you did in, in 2010, which a blog uh, to, to monitor the relief and reconstruction efforts. And really from that very beginning, it was February 2010, the overwhelming question was, where is the money going? Who's getting it? And where should it be going? And that was really my entry into this, this whole question. In terms of where the money's going, right, the first thing that was really striking was discovering that most of the money was actually going to organizations here in the United States, and specifically quite a few organizations that were just a few blocks from my office in Washington and not to organizations in Haiti, right? And so we had this information, you know, but these reports, the databases, you can get access to this, but it's all in English, right? And you have to know precisely where to look and, and what you're looking for, right? And that was a, uh, something that we, in a, being in Washington and being you know, familiar with that process, 
ultimately had greater access to information than a lot of individuals and organizations in Haiti who were the ones who were actually doing this work and could really use that information. And so what we viewed our role as was sort of an intermediary to be able to take this information and synthesize it and get it out there so that those groups on the ground could actually have some uh, awareness and information to advocate for a change in how that money was being spent. See, there's a lot of different mechanisms and pathways for money to get from developed countries, rich countries, into Haiti, right? So you have the formal bilateral aid from agencies like USAID, the United States Agency for International Development, similar agencies from the EU, Canada, etc. You've got private donations, right? By some estimates, up to 50% of American families donated to the relief effort. That money's channeled through slightly different pathways, right? And then you have big funds coming through development banks, the IMF, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and things like that. And they're all a little bit different in how they work. But the overall picture is pretty clear. After the first couple years of the earthquake, less than 1% of money had actually gone to Haitian organizations or the Haitian government itself, right? Less than 1%. If you look narrowing in on USAID, the numbers were slightly better, but still far below 10% even of the money going directly to Haitian entities. Now, the response is that, well, we subcontract with Haitian entities. Money goes through different layers. Okay, there's a few problems with that. One is the first person that gets the money takes their share of the money. And the second person takes their share. By the time you actually get to the ground, you've got a lot less money left over, right? So where did the money go? Well, a lot of it went to these intermediary steps before it ever made it to the ground. And the other issue with this is, right, not just, you know, how that money happens, but the transparency with it, right? So I could find, as a researcher here, there are tools and databases where you can find the top-level recipient of U.S. money. But there's no transparency around what they do with it and who those subcontractors are. And so you can say that, yes, more money gets to Haiti. And it's assuredly true. There is more money going to that than that top line number of, you know, 1%, 5%. But it was impossible to quantify because we simply didn't have the data. The government was put in a position after the earthquake where it was abundantly clear that they needed outside support. Right? They needed the resources. But donors come in and say, well, we'll give you the resources under these specific conditions. And so you're put in a pretty impossible choice, right? I mean, do you accept that assistance with all of those conditions that come with it? Or do you not accept those, that money and try and move forward amongst this you know, calamitous situation without that outside support? And that's not an easy choice to make. So we see the United States, for example, and this is not just a problem of leadership, it's, a, it's also a problem of c Congress. Because Congress was the one that said, okay, we'll allocate this money to Haiti, but only if you spend it on X, Y, and Z. And so that's what they had to do. And so instead of getting these big pooled funds where you could take on big ticket items, which is what the Haitian government wanted and expected in some regards in terms of this coordination mechanism, you really saw that, that structure, that apparatus sort of crumble apart over time. And I think what it really speaks to ultimately, right, is this, this question of control, right? I mean, who is really in control of how this money is being spent? And ultimately, who is it intended to benefit, right? And the way that the United States has structured our foreign aid system is so that it is much a uh, domestic stimulus and jobs program here that it is about development in a country like Haiti, right? We have to grapple with that and try and change those systems and those structures and those laws that are in place that prevent us from actually delivering effective assistance. Yeah, I think the most shocking thing to me, and I think in a lot of ways this is what convinced me that this was what I wanted to continue to do and continue to look at, right? It was the 2010 election. Yeah. And that was held in the aftermath of the earthquake, more than a million people displaced. And we were among many groups sort of elevating voices from Haiti, expressing serious concern around rushing into this electoral process with all of the limitations and all of the you know broader circumstances that seemed to indicate to most people that this was not going to go well. And of course, it, it didn't go well, but what actually was so shocking was then seeing what happened afterwards, seeing the intervention of international actors to try and manage that situation, to eventually overturn those election results, and the mechanisms by which they would do that, threatening to withhold aid uh, and things like this, threatening visas, in fact, in some cases, pulling visas. There's a story in here uh, in the book where you know a, a former government official recalls uh, somebody from the UN calling and saying, if you don't get on board with this, we're gonna send protesters to your doorstep. Right? This is an international official calling a Haitian government official and saying, if you don't agree to our demands about your election, 
we're gonna send protesters to your doorstep. So the ways in which this influence of the United States manifested itself was just so shocking. It was just, it was so blatant and out in the open. And for, for myself, the background looking at US foreign policy and being interested in US foreign policy, you don't often see how that works. It happens in the shadows, it happens in back rooms, and, and in Haiti it was just happening right in your face. And this election, watching it all take place as we were doing our own analysis of the results and then watching what was happening on the ground and with this, these interventions, it, it was just so stark, right? And in the you know, 10, 14 years now that it's been since then, just more and more information has come out, more and more people have spoken out about what was really going on at that time. And to me, it really just encapsulates so much about the relationship between foreign actors, specifically the United States and Haiti's government, how it politically intervenes and does this. But taking a longer view also, how that always blows back, right? Because it's not just shocking that it happened and that it happened so obviously at the time, but then that once the United States was committed to that path, it did everything in its power to justify that decision, right? And to try and support that government that it brought to power, despite a track record that was getting worse and worse and worse by the year. They didn't want to hear it. And so this didn't just affect one election, right? This changed the trajectory of a country, right? And to see that play out year after year after year, over 14 years, uh, was I think really shocking and really illuminating for me, uh, not just in terms of the influence of Asian politics, but how U.S. foreign policy really works.